Pierre, I would say. And then Don Gluck, who wrote the original four mini comics. And then representing the modern area, we've got. What's his name again? Toy Guru. I really don't think I need to introduce him at this point, right? I'll, I'll take him. I'm just, I'm just glad people can pronounce my name. <laughs> well, it's got, you got that DC Classics figure. That's the entire, my, my favorite part about that. People can pronounce my name. So, that was the best part of Jeff naming that character. Yeah, it makes it. Oh, here's Jimmy. And then we got Jimmy. Tim Seeley. Hey. Who is the writer on the. Co writer. Co writer, yes, because Scott Knight was also involved. On the four new mini. or three. three uh, I, I, I kept we'll hearing four, and I kept getting confused. We'll get into it's that. definitely three. Oh, it's definitely three. Definitely three. It's for definitely, sure three. It's for sure three. Okay, we're going to start at the beginning. That's Don Blue. Let's hear the original four. Let's begin with him. Woo! Don? Don. 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 It's funny because until I came to this con convention today, I never called those mini I never thought of those as comics. Once I did those four little books, I looked at them as booklets, story booklets. Uh, so I never thought of them as comics because they were more like big little books because there weren't panels, you know, furthering the action. It was like, you know, one illustration and then the text below describing what was happening in, in the panel. So. If you want to call mini comics, that's fine. Uh, I've also been in the comic book business, and writing comics is a whole a completely different experience for me from writing those uh, those little books. What? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, what do you want to know? <laughs> so, let's look how you became involved. How did they okay, all right. Involved? I'll tell you the whole story. And this is going to sort of shock some some people. Maybe get them ready to lynch me. I don't know. But I'll, 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 be, I'll be straight. At the time in my life, um, my name was sort of hot because I had just finished The Empire Strikes Back, which novel, which got a lot of notoriety. All kinds of things, uh, getting a lot of animation work, just a lot of things. I was also writing a series of comic books for Western Publishing Company, which had a line of And I was doing some sword and sorcery for them, a character called Dagar the Invincible. And I was also writing Cull the Destroyer over at Marvel. So I had, my name was associated with Sorcery. And Del Canell, who was the editor at Western Publishing Company, who was like the go-between between the talent and studios or Warners and everybody they had the contracts with to provide the material for books and whatever they were doing. And he was always, he had sort of a mother hen attitude about him. He liked making sure that people that worked for him could pay their bills and everything. So he tried throwing them as much work as possible. So he said, Don, do you want to do this? And I said, sure. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of, uh, it wasn't called Masters of the Universe back then. In fact, Scott told me today, he reminded me something I had totally forgotten, that it was originally called The Fighting Foes. I, I denied I had anything to do with it until he showed me uh, a Xerox of the manuscript with my name on it. And then it all came back. Uh, they came to me, uh, it was in two parts. Um, they wanted to, me to write these four little booklets, and then they wanted me to create a bunch of character names and ideas for toys and, and that sort of thing, and a back of sort. But when they came to me, they had no idea what the plot was, what the characters did. All they knew was what characters looked like. They had a handful of them, all made out of the same molds, just dressed differently. Uh, they gave me a, a handful bad Polaroid photographs, that the colors were all wrong, and the reason Castle, the reason Castle Gray Skull is named that when it's a green skull, it's because the photograph that they gave me of the castle toy, the prototype, was gray. That's how it looked in the photo. And at the time, I, they weren't paying me a lot of money. I got, didn't know, when you consider what this thing has be, become, I got almost nothing. <laughs> And I wasn't getting, they told me I wasn't going to get my name on it. So when I, whenever that happens to me, here's the route I take. First, I, draw, I try to put as little thought process in, as possible into the project. Second, to do it as fast as I can. And third, to fill it with lots of injuries. So if in the future, somebody said, you didn't write that. I said, oh, yeah, look, look, there's my friend. You know, this spelled backwards is so-and-so's name. And um, um, so uh, my... Then future ex-wife's maiden name was Gray. It was Linda Gray. So I said, well, let's see if I can get some, uh, you know, another one of my intros. So I gave it, named it Gray Skull. 
I didn't know the castle was green until after my divorce, and I stepped into a Toys R Us, and I saw the toy green thing. And that, that's the first time I knew it was green. Um, I made up some names. I didn't make up He-Man, which I thought was a, I still think is one of the most ludicrous names I've ever heard. When I was a little kid, He-Man was a, a derogatory. You can go eat your Wheaties and become a He-Man. And then you can go kick sand in the face in the wind, on the, you know. So I, I didn't like that name, but they they were naming, man was in the name, like at that point, everybody had man at the end of their name. So Skeletor was named something else, I think. Uh, Demo Man. Yeah, that's, I, I, it, was, it was a take off a demon, <laughs> demon, demon, you know. And I put a girl in the story, which they didn't want to do. They said, little boys are going to buy these toys. They're not going to uh, want to play with a little girl toy. But then they figured, hey, we can make one old and then keep redressing it, we get a lot of, maybe the girls will buy it, and we can make a whole line of female characters. And I didn't, again, I wasn't getting my name under, so how was I going to, what am I going to call it? So I made it, I, I originally called her She-Man, which they <laughs> went through the roof. And uh, so we were going to call her She-Man. Um, so I, I thought, for some reason, I, I remember a TV show I saw as a kid called Smiling Ed's Gang, which had a story they used to run, an East Indian Mahout, an elephant boy who had a pet elephant named uh, Tila. So I just called it Tila. Now, the, the strange thing, the ironic thing is, I found out just months, just a few months after he died, that the, one of the producers on the He Man show, Joe Mazuka, yeah. played the Indian boy on that show I used to watch as a kid. And I wonder if he ever, if it ever occurred to him, why is Where's his name, Tila? That's the name of the elephant I had on my show. And I used to go to Filmation. I may have passed him on the hall and could have, you know, talked about this. And so, so that never happened. And um, difference in comics, writing comics. Well, the Marvel style, you do the artwork first, and you write, you know, you write your text over it. Um, the old DC fans write a script like a movie script with descriptions. But the way we wrote these, they again, they had no idea what. Um, Eternia, Eternia was, I just seen a rerun of Fantasia, and I said, well, this is kind of an eternal realm. You've got people with ray guns and other people running, running around with timeless place. So Eternia uh, sounded sort of like Fantasia. That's where that came from. Um, and um, they told me, that, well, the stories would have a certain amount of and half the page would be a picture. And I brought my friend Alfredo Alcala in to do the illustrations. He was working for Marvelous Sword and here was the tricky part. They, you had to have on every page the exact same number, not only of lines, but characters. So I would set my time so about before you hit the end of the line, the ding would go off. And once I heard the ding, I knew that I had I needed a word with three letters or maybe a space and two letters or something, two letters and a hyphen. And I would continue until I came to the end, allowing a little space ahead of time. So when I got to the last page, word of the last sentence, it didn't matter if I ended at the beginning of the line or at the end of the line. And it worked out. And those were written so fast, I'm not exaggerating. I'm, not, I'm, I'm being straight with you. I started the story with having very, really no idea where it was going to go or how it was going to end. Everything you read was first draft on a typewriter. I just sat there and I cranked one afternoon. I did one, one afternoon, I did it, and it was done. And that was, and that was how those came about. And that's, that's how we did it. So my entire childhood of expansion <laughs> was based on, on Doug Luke cracking some shit out. <laughs> Bad Little Clouds was named after an 8mm silent movie I had that was made about 1903 that had some really hokey special effects that I loved. As, you know, I got it from Black Hawk, and the films were called Bad Little Clouds. That's where that title came from. Separation on those many comics. A little bit of the things that you liked being made of those things? Oh, well, I, I tend to, you know, I write a lot of things in a lot of different but I look at everything I do is taking place in the same universe. So I plan little, if I'm writing a script for a TV show or a, or a, a movie or a novel or whatever, I, if you read between the lines, you'll see all kinds of little hidden things that lead you to different other companies' characters. In fact, I did a whole Dagar story where Dagar's girlfriend rode off at the end and left them and ended, ended the Cull series with amnesia. And then she at the end, she got tired of Cull and she wrote back to Dagar. Do that kind of thing all the time. <laughs>
And someday when I'm dead, and some, some geek with a lot of time on his or her hands is going to discover, they're going to, you know, sitting there with nothing to do, they're going to figure out all these. That's, really, my, really that's my master plan. I really hope to be that geek. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after, after year four, the, the mini comics kind of jumped from Western over to DC, and then they landed with Lee Nordling and his team of creators, which included you, right, Larry? Yeah, that's where I first ran into, got involved with the show, because Lee gave me a call one day and said, hey, you want to draw some comic books? I'm like, sure, what you got? And then when I went to his house, he showed me the uh, and stuff and said, he gave us the format, and said, hey, got about eight pages here, and here's a script, and you know, can you do it? I'm going, sure, that sounds, looks like He had was pretty huge, like, you, you started it, so there was no kind of other mediums and things no, like right, that. No, it was nothing but, like, six. It was already out there. Yeah. So was this like any kind of pressure, or did you kind of know what was going on, like how big He Man was and how big this project really was? Yeah, it was filmation's like a uh, breakout hit in syndication. And, and um, when Lee told me about it, you know, it's like I was working at filmation about up until the year that they started, you know, I left before they started uh, He Man. So I had friends that were still working there, so I knew of the series, I watched it and everything, so I was pretty familiar with it, and when he, when he gave me the uh, the assignment, it was like, it just looked like a lot of fun, I hadn't had a chance to go in years, so it's like, uh, okay, let's go for it, you know, so I just took the assignment and ran with it, the uh, the one cool thing that I talked to Lee about when I started getting trips was that um, they came up with these new characters and uh, different realms that He-Man was facing, and so I asked him, like, models of these things, or do they know what they look like? Say, no, 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 just make up what you want. So, yeah, okay, so I decided to, when I was drawing the script, I create some other realm, other different ethnic groups in the, in the mythology. So I started, you know, created a, a black race over here, I created an Indian race over here. I just kind of like mixed it all up and just had some fun with it, basically. I think I got in trouble with one of them, though, the, uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the parents were saying, this is a little bit too violent for our kids. <laughs> I didn't get any more assignments after that. <laughs> but, well, that's fine, you know. I was always busy working on, um, I think at the time I was friends or uh, G.I. Joe Transformers and stuff. So this is kind of like a side gig that I was doing. But uh, I had a lot of fun. It was, like, great to actually, you know, go back and comic books again. Uh, I had done some before on my own and did some with the Roy Thomas, and uh, so it was, uh, it was it was fun. Now this this has had to do with many comics really, but I have to throw it out there because I love it. The opening sequence from GI Joe the movie. Oh. Yeah. Weren't you, uh, weren't you responsible for that? I made it all up. That was all. What? Yeah. Yeah. That is the best animated. How cool is that? Ever. I, it was it was at the time it was Don George. He was the executive producer on the series, and there were like three of us. He said he gave us a sign that well, I needed opening titles, and it was myself, Boyd Kirkland, and uh, Frank Parr. He said, "Okay, guys, make up something and uh, show me what you got to do their own thing." And at that time, I think it was a uh, it was a uh, the Statue of Liberty was some kind of centennial, or whatever it was, was coming up, and so I keyed me into like. Okay, let me send him some statue of liberty. And I just started drawing, just made it all up, and it was like a lot of fun. It was fun actually getting the animation coming back from Japan, going, oh, they actually animated this. <laughs> and it's on ones, too. I mean, it was like gorgeous, you know, especially the pencil test. First, I guess, 10 or 15 minutes of the show, it's all, it's all me. I made it all up. It is also the best 80s theme song remake remix ever. <laughs> no offense to He-Man. That is the best. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun to draw, a lot of fun to see the end result. Sometimes you work in animation, you kind of do your best on the storyboard. You sit, it's like you make a infant, you send it out and wait for it to come back. And you don't know. It can be really great looking or it can be like, oh, man. What, the, you know, what happened? You know. But that, yeah, that came back looking. 
that sequence like still gives me chills. So, I mean, it sounds weird, but it does. I'm very strange. Yeah. Um, so the you, you penciled the powers of grace legend again the first part, which kind of leads us into the next segment, right. um, which is the modern era. How did this come about? How did these? In, for anybody that doesn't know the deal on the, the new mini comics, can you fill everybody in on what's happening? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I feel how I feel about that era <laughs> with one. <laughs> <laughs> And it's more wishful yeah, thinking era. No, it's definitely. So, um, yeah, so the, so the backstory to the new ones, obviously mini comics are a huge part of the history of Masters of the Universe. And when we started the classics line, the first thing we did was we got everything that had ever been written about anything, Masters. We didn't have rights to the Filmation series until about two months ago. So we were really only trying to look at the, the, the you know, everyone knows Masters of things that were written uh, before the filmation series, like Donald Glut's original transcript for the Fighting Foeman. Oh my God. Yeah, wow. I mean, like, we're I gotta read that. There you go. There's the emo man right there. Who do you think we're making up that name? Yeah, yeah. By the way, Merman was a good guy. Right? Yeah, Merman's a good guy. Also called Sea Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect to a She Man. <laughs> we, got, we got Woodsman and Ka Man. And, uh, well, anyway, so. We did a lot of research. We found everything we could in the Mattel archives or anyone who would help us out with stuff. Uh, so what we wanted to do mini comics from day one. We would love mini comics with every figure. They're really expensive to do. Really, the only reason we were able to do them for 2012, which is the 30th anniversary, is we were given design management who said, hey, you know, here's X amount of money that we want to do something really special for the 30th anniversary of Masters. You know, and myself as brand manager, I was like, well, you know, I wonder if we could do mini comics with this amount of money. So we, you know, luckily uh, I've been working on the uh, DC Comics line for a few years. So I knew a few folks in the comic industry, called them up, said, hey, I've got X amount of money. If I wanted to do a, you know, an eight-page mini comic, how many could I do for this? Well, you could actually do three issues. Okay, really? That's great. So we actually wound up getting in touch with Dark Horse Comics, and we hired them strictly as a work-for-hire agreement. So just you would hire a vendor, or like how Don was hired originally to be the writer. Uh, the mini comics are owned by Mattel, the art's owned by Mattel, but Dark Horse was going to supply the talent as far as the artist, the cover artist, and the writer, uh, and Tim here. And essentially this was a one-time deal that was funded by a grant from David Boss, Terry Bucci Boss, uh, Terry the Mattel designer who worked with the horseman. And uh, that's pretty much the backstory to how we had it happen. It's issues. They're going to be available with the first three quarterly variant figures of 2012. So that would be He-Man, Battle, yeah, thank you, He-Man, uh, that we haven't re revealed the other two yet. Uh, the fourth one won't come into the comic. They will be included for free. They're basically Thunder Punch here. They're Mattel's gift to the fans. That's our birthday gift to the fans. And uh, actually kind of tagging on the previous panel that was on the 2002 series, before he left Mattel, I actually sat down with him and he gave me everything he'd been working on. And in addition to Don's Fighting Foeman script and Michael Halpern's Bible, we used Ian's notes from what was going to be the fourth season with the Horde returning as the background to really the overall classic storyline, which up until the mini comics had only pulled through bios on the back of the figures. The mini comics was the first time we could really put words and pictures together. And you know, for those of you who have a copy, um, who came to the signing earlier or a comic on, we pick up pretty much just as Ian was saying. The masters are renegades. They're living in a, in a, in a cave. I actually didn't even know they were going to live in a cave. That was coincidence. <laughs> that was really cool. The Tundarian, he called it what, the Cave of Power or something? Freedom. 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 So, well, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it gets renamed the Cave of Freedom after the war. <laughs> 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 so, so they're in the caves of Tundaria, and. Uh, and, and the sorceress is dead, and Teal is the new sorceress. Vanish to Despondos, and on the first page, he, Randor, this is Randor returning. So it should be ushering, you know, in that the new stories are now going to happen. The, the, the masters have been renegades for the past few years, and we're, we're now picking up. We've kind of jumped ahead maybe a year or two from episode 38 or 39 with the defeat of Surfos. It actually even says that. It has been a long time since the defeat of Surfos. 
365 days. <laughs> <laughs> Is a year the same amount of time on Antonia? Yeah. Um, so that's really the backstory of how we got happened. The, the plot, so I wrote out the plot basically as like a two or three page outline that I emailed to Tim in the dark horse. And then Tim uh, beat that out an actual script with dialogue, sent it back to us. We made a few minor comments. I think there were like two or three dialogues that we just wanted to tweak a little, make more character. <coughs> But um, really, that was how it, it came about. That's why, I, that's why I'm credited as, as story mod. But um, Tim really wrote the actual dialogue, and he made some really wise choices. Well, I mean, with Scott is the keeper of the sort of mythology that is made, you know, that, that over time the brand has kind of created. So me not, me being just a fan, uh, him, he sent me all this stuff, which is, this is what happens in Master like, Really? So I'm excited like you guys. I was, that's what happened. Uh, but yes, and I just had to translate it into, into yeah. it. I think like one of the best things you did was at the uh, at the end of the first issue, in the, he, just like in the original uh, Powers of Grey School first issue, he then went back yeah. uh, to, back to his time, and then the second issue was between the two issues. Yeah. Why does he have to travel twice? Like, duh, what a better <laughs> idea. Um, which actually, the, the final point I should say is, Comics, the Powers of Grayskull, uh, which was supposed to be the kickoff of the 1987 line that was going to introduce Hero and the dinosaurs and, and have He-Man going back in time. That uh, that was written as a first issue. The cover kind of looked similar to this. And it said, you know, the legend begins, part one of three. Part two and three never got made, never shipped. That pissed me off so oh, bad. Me too. <laughs> So part of what we wanted to do for the 30th was make it up to the fans. We wanted to sort of do things kind of like Fearless Photon and, and fulfill promises that had been out there for 20, 30 years. Luckily, Tim Kilpin, who was the marketing manager and actually originally copywriter on Masters of the Universe back day, he still had the outline for the Powers of Grayskull. It wasn't a full script. It was just a basic, it was like a two-page synopsis, which actually the first page is in the art book that we sold at Comic-Con in 09, if you have that. Um, and so he had, he gave that to me, and we used that as sort of to help fill in the gaps. We combined that with the fact that, you know, for example, if, if you're in the previous panel, they were talking about King Grayskull, King Grayskull being the ancestor of He-Man, but in the original version of Grayskull, Hero is the ancestor, and we knew fans were going to want toys of both Hero and King Grayskull, so we did what everyone does in and uh, we basically said that Grayskull was going to be the blood ancestor, and Hero was going to be the sword bearer, like the one who brought the sword. And passed it to Grayskull, and then it would go down the lineage of He-Man or, or Adam. So we basically, this first issue is a retelling of the in with some of the retro conning, like, you know, you see in the first page them coming back from Lunaria, and you see Tila as the new sorceress, Tila, now the new sorcerer, sends He-Man back to Fraternia, and even the last page, the last page of the original mini-comic, had Hero in one box in show, saving the day, so we, we recreated that, and we even put the, the same final box that said, uh, you know, who is this mysterious new hero? To learn the answer and more, pick up the next amazing issue of the powers of Grayskull. And this time, we really, really will <laughs> <play. laughs> So in the next issue, you'll meet King Grayskull, and you'll have Hero, King Grayskull, and He-Man fighting together, side by side, the three of them, for the first time. Together again, for the first time. I have all that art on my iPad right now, so, so don't steal that. <laughs> <laughs> you mean this iPad? <laughs> <laughs> this second issue? Oh, oh that, that one, one right oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Told us. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we're working we're working on the second issue now, and then there'll be a third issue. The second issue is like a pre-Turnia feast of everything you could want to happen in pre-Turnia. It's almost all splash pages, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> splash pages of this size are not the greatest. Yeah. But we actually, yeah. that's why we drew it at full size, with the intent that eventually we could reprint. Trade paper. Yeah, exactly. With bonus material, or Don's original script, who knows. Um, so, yeah, and this, so the second issue is this great Victoria battle, and the third issue is going to, you'll finally see the second ultimate battleground that we've been hinting at, and it is, I think there's three double splash pages. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think your script, the way you called it out, was, like, 
put in as many characters as humanly possible without needing a therapist. Yeah. There's also a the, the script that says, uh, what? Another double page spread? Well, yes. Another double page spread. Because the poor artist is like, oh, God, Jesus. Yeah, we're trying to do crazy changes to make sure the characters are the model, and that there was a panel where Lost Man's weapon wasn't correct. It was like, no, you have to redraw it. The battle line one of them, I thought was the funniest one. The, the your battle line and then die. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Which is awesome. I was like, I'll have that figure by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, this, that's basically the story of the, the next three mini comics. We actually did write a fourth one that was going to the secret origin of Skeletor that's going to finally tell oh. that story. Oh. We did write it. it. It's right here, the origin of Skeletor. It's a, a nine-page script. We're holding on to it, hoping maybe we can do it one day. We basically don't have the funds to fund it, but maybe one day it'll be like related to the other three. The other three were one, two, and three, and the fourth issue would have been a standalone secret origin of Skeletor. Uh, we would have learned the origin of the Havoc and all sorts of cool stuff. Okay, I hope you get to it. It's, it's written and it's, it's nice because it's approved and we have it done, which is the important part. Um, <laughs> I want to know, as, as a, you're a professed teammate fan, yep. how does this feel to be involved in this project? Let's start with, uh, I'm five years old, uh, it's 1982, and uh, for my birthday, my mom gives me uh, this figure, and it has a comic in it. Five years old, I read it, it's King of Castle Grayskull, which is the fourth one that Don um, did, and it blew my mind. Uh, like, as a kid, I, I became obsessed with this thing. I still have that copy. I read it so many times that it fell apart. I restapled it. It <laughs> fell apart. I taped it together. <laughs> so, as a kid, I'm five years old. I was obsessed with you and my brother and I. Uh, I had two brothers, and we lived in, in the country. And uh, we we uh, had nothing to do except for play with each other with human figures. And uh, um, Except my other brother, who really liked Joe. And at the time, we were always like, Jojo was so gay, and then we didn't realize that He-Man was a naked guy in a very <laughs> <laughs> pants. How that escaped. I became really into comic books based on the, these mini comics that came with uh, He-Man. So I, my first Spider-Man comic was after I got the uh, uh, mini comic that came with figures, um, and I became obsessed with comics. And I never got over it. Uh, to this day, I work in comics. Over. Um, so I started to, uh, I worked at, I do a comic called Hack Slash, which is a, a horror comic, uh, kind of a homage to Asian. I met a guy at Dark Horse who was really into horror movies and was kind of just surprised that I made an intelligent, well, I, it's his words, not mine, an intelligent take on horror movies. Uh, I don't know if it is, but whatever. He was kind of surprised, and he, he was a big horror fan. And uh, so we got to be kind of friends, just sort of corresponding over email and stuff. And, Wrote this comic book uh, for my as a sort of a, you know a break from Hack Slash called Colt Noble and the Mega Lords, which is a sort of parody of Masters of the Universe. Um, Buy this comic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Hilarious. But it's just a parody. It's kind of a funny thing. It's uh, you know sort of like what would really happen if you were a 13 year old and you could have the body of an adult. If you could really do that, what would you do with it? So it's kind of a parody comic and. Uh, it's so. Human Teen Sex Comedy. Yeah, it's Human Teen Sex Comedy. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, Scott. That's exactly wow. You've got it. Um, so Dark Horse, uh, because Scott uh, at Dark Horse called me up and said, you wrote that cool novel thing. You like He-Man, don't you? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it a lot. It's like, you want to write it? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, he, he was working on, on with Mattel on this. And, uh, you know, to me, as a guy who literally always only wanted to do He-Man as a comic, um, this was like the greatest opportunity ever. And so, you know, I talked to Scott about it, and basically, you know, as a kid, I was tortured by the fact that the pre-20 story was one issue. And I, as a kid, did my own comics where I, we found out who pre So damn dedicated to find out who this character was. Uh, he turned out to be, well, the, the, the heading said the most powerful magician. The opposite of He-Man, he was super intelligent, he was very strong, but he was very intelligent, and he was very, like, he was the guy who was all the wizardly stuff, I don't know, whatever. So I did all these like, little comics. I had my own, uh, I used to draw all that, that character, uh, Tyrannosaurus, which was the coolest toy in my, I ever saw in my life. I had all these stories about uh, they stole the good guy's Tyrannosaurus back so that he could be a good guy. And I thought a purple dinosaur with a gun should be a good guy. But anyway, um, but yeah, so just given this opportunity, 
Chicago, so I had met Don, actually. I interviewed him for a podcast once. You did? Yeah. Oh, it's at it's more? Yeah, I write a video. In person? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I knew the backstory of the mini talk because I asked Don about it, and uh, it was funny because it, you can hear my heart break. Because I say like, "Oh my God, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard." Where did you come with stuff? Like, and, and Don tells the story exactly as he told it, which is, "Yeah, I got some, I had a job, and I had to do this thing, and uh, my wife was named Grace, so there you go." And like, I'm like, <laughs> you can just hear my heart break already. Like, Wait, it, it wasn't the most important thing you ever. <laughs> So, in, in the divorce was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I should be flattered or apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, not at all. Because certainly, uh, you know, well, I mean, obviously, you know, working for, for the, the thing about He-Man when you're a kid, it's majestic, it's mythology, it's it's religion to you. And, you know, I. I, I lived in the country and had nothing to do, and me and my brothers were like looking for something to escape, having this attorney thing. I don't think Don gives himself enough credit for coming in and making toys, which were awesome plastic sculpts, very compelling. Like, I don't think he gives himself credit for what? saying, I made up this thing that kids got lost in for 30 years of their lives. But I can, just, I, I can relate to Tim being affected by something. That, and being able to write something that you fell in love with as a kid, because to me, I wrote with, uh, for Russ Manning on, on those Tarzan books we did for England, and, uh, and Captain America. To me, writing Captain America, not only in the comic books, but Marvel, yeah. uh, being able to take a character that you loved as a kid and direct that character's life, is, it's like, can be a big deal. Yeah, I got, I had to follow up with Dwayne Don, because I got a chance to uh, produce and direct a series that inspired me as a kid, you know, Stanley and Jack Kirby stuff. You know, the X-Men series, I was able to produce and direct that. So I understand what you're talking about, running with something that you grew up as a kid and you idolized. And, and I know, I mean, you know, he made such a good, in a good place because Scott is like me. He's that guy that was sort of just warpedly affected by this thing that he made it his life, his career. And I, I'm in that same place where I, I never got overcome. I mean, this is 30 years on my life where I'm saying, these guys made a thing, and I it, I never got over it. Like, which is it's awesome to be able to like. You guys, it's mostly fans that loved it before reading these mini comics, but the notion that maybe some kids like you, we got this young guy here and these young guys over here, thirty years from now, they never got over this thing that you did. Don't uh, get over it. <laughs> 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 it's really inspirational, I think. You know, it's you just sort of all apart, and that's you know. See, to me, I, I just have, I have a hard time, though, you know, a lot of the stuff, I, I mean, I've done a lot of things uh, for a lot of different franchises, and a lot of stuff I, 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 you know, I thought was pretty crappy stuff. I wrote, like, a dozen Transformers. I, I think every one of them, I just, it was just half cranked out on a typewriter, one script a day, you know, uh, with, with the liquid paper, I mean, in, the, in that, that stage, or you didn't even bother making corrections because it took too long for the, the liquid paper to dry, you know. So, uh, and... 30, 20, 30 years later, they want to do interviews, and these things, how oh, I changed their life with, the, you know, Megaton's master plan or some stupid thing. And I, I, can't, I can't relate to it because, really, you know, especially in Saturday morning cartoons, uh, I don't know, I'll probably insult something here now, but I have, I've written a lot of Saturday morning cartoons, and maybe, maybe a half a dozen at the most that I have any pride in at all, because most of them are just half, I found out long time ago, you do anything special, anything beyond the norm, the lowest common denominator that the sponsor of the toy company or the network sensor wants to see, oh, you're not going to write, write another one because they want them all to be the same. And there's only a handful that I really considered the above the, above the average. So, um, I'm, what was the point? I was, I was trying to, I was thinking <laughs> up this um, Oh, yeah, I'm just a uh, influence. I, there's, there's somebody that built a whole website for me just because I had written his favorite episodes of Spider-Man and his amazing friends. He did an elaborate website for free for me about you know my career and everything. And um, so it's nice to have people out there. That, but I, I, some of it my, my, it boggles my mind because I don't really think it was really that very 
good to begin with, you know. So I just have a hard time seeing how people were affected by this instead of affected by something like that that might be really special. Right, Don, I don't think you've given yourself enough credit because I think when you were growing up and um, how to create story structure and creating compelling characters, I think you brought that to everything you did, even though you did it on a Take more credit than what you did. You had the talent. You had the talent to pull it together. Hey, for let's give him a hand. A lot of the stories we've done, I've done, whether they're in comics or animation or whatever, when there are certain genres, they're they're all the same story. There's you got an evil wizard or somewhere in a castle. He's trying to get this thing, a jewel or something, which when he gets it, will give him power over the. And you got some burly hero with a sword trying to stop him. And somewhere along the line, a girl gets captured, and then he, he has to fight his way, and, and, and that's the way they are. You can take that same plot, turn it into a superhero. It's, not, no, long, it's no longer a, a wizard. It's Dr. Doom. He gets this sort of, this energy source, and, and it's basically the same story over and over. It's just, it's the Joseph Campbell thing, you know. And you can just, you just substitute different characters. I was working once at... Um, for Dennis Martin on one of the Marvel um, shows, and he was going to reject the whole plot because the MacGuffin in it was a uh, an energy star or something. And I said, well, why don't we just change it to? And, and I, I just thought, my head, why don't we change from an energy? To, 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 and he looked at me and said, how did you do that? How, that's amazing. Huh? It's a whole new story now. And it was simply the story <laughs> with, a, with a different MacGuffin. That's all. Yeah. I mean. But I mean, I think that's. What, what kind of gets sometimes lost when you, every generation, you know, when our generation who were here, team at Ben, when you were a kid, you know, when you were 19 or whatever, and Power Rangers come out, and you were like, mm -hmm. yet, uh, it's how it attacks, it's, it's when you saw it first, because that was the moment that you saw this escape to a world where things were cool, where bad guys had skulls for faces and were clearly dicks. And, you know, beautiful girls were the good people. And you never, you, those moments are going to be your escape because in the real world, things are gray, and sometimes they're a little bit this, and sometimes they're a little bit that. And you, you escape to a world where the good realms called Eternia, and the bad guys hang out on Snake Mountain, not the mountains of Afghanistan where, you know, I mean, you, you want, I think He Man, why it's so great is. It is the simplest distillation of the ultimate escape. It is the man, the guy who's great, looks like the guy who's great, and his his beautiful partner and where he gets his wisdom and it's perfect and simple, and that's why it will probably resonate from now until the end of time. And, and you know, Don got that, and and Scott gets that, and Larry got that, and hopefully I pulled that off. But that's why it works. I think that brings us to a perfect point for audience questions. So you guys got questions for these guys? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> We've answered all the questions they've ever okay, had. Okay, I think you were up first. Let's go with you. Um, actually, this is maybe I can answer it with uh, the origin of Skeletor sitting in front of him. Um, <laughs> I was gonna ask this uh, of Dean, and maybe you can just. Well, I mean, there's like like the untold part of it. Um, a friend sent to me a, a long time ago, maybe about two or three years ago, sort of saying that it was like a sort of not a film, but a, sort of like a s small story snippet, saying that um, Miro had two sons. His the uh, the wife of Miro mysteriously died or something. Uh, there was no uh, Randolph had an older brother, and he disappeared as well. Miro had a combine, which made Keldor. Well, the thing is, Emiliano kind of Emiliano kind of confirmed it too on one of the Facebook pages. So I'm just wondering, is that one of the stories that came from the 2000 X series with with Dean and his two brothers? Uh, Randor was um, how do I say this? I'm like I'll be Randor and Keldor definitely have a different mother. Yeah, and um, is a blue skin dar, and the she was a of those too. two women, uh, Keldor's mother, and integral 
to what happens to Keldor and why the throne isn't passed to him and some sort of that. I mean, that for those of you who were in the, the, the previous panel, they, they were talking a bit about, uh, we, we actually, a lot of Keldor, Skelts, Skeldor, Skeletor, Keldor's origin did come from that, that line in the 2002 series where Keldor says to Prince Adam, oh, he's you know, doing just like your father, taking what doesn't belong to you, with the idea that, that, that Skel Keldor was and he should have inherited the throne. So that sort of, once we kind of locked in on that point, taken from the 2002 series, as uh, it did make it into the show, it became very clear that, wow, Skeletor is so much more of a deeper character, just in the sense that every single time he's going, Eteria will be mine! It should be his. He is the true, he's the firstborn heir. Why the throne doesn't get past him and why he doesn't become king and Randor becomes king is extremely important to why he turns, you know, he winds up turning to a dark arts teacher. A lot of this has come out in the bios in the classics line. Um, you know, I mean, you know, it's been about Keldor being banished and you know, turning to, you know, going to the dark arts. Um, you know, that that's definitely related to what happened to both mother and Randor's mother, um, as well as the history of the Gar people. Which we expanded in the in the bios, which comes out in that fourth mini comic. So far, it's only in script form, but th there's clearly some some history of, of the Gars. Um, I think it was hinted at in Cyclone's bio um, that they that there's a line in the bio about them uh, terrorizing Eternia in, 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 the, in the past. So clearly, there is some some prejudicial issues going on with the blue skin. We would we would want to play out. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it kind of does because it's one of those things where we, I can't find the source origin of this like email that was sent, and I'm, I'm just a, a potential script that existed saying what? that Randor had another brother, and that Keldor there was actually no King Randor. Was no, not yeah, yeah. Working on the line. thing I knew about those characters were what I put in the stories because I was making up it as, as I went along. I, they didn't give me in any backstory at all. So actually. 2000X when they were doing it, was that a potential script from them back in 2002? A script about Keldor's origin. Um, saying that, because from what I heard, and I, I'm, I can't find it anywhere, but it was forwarded from other people saying that. That's because you made it up. <laughs> 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 but it's just one of those things that kind of like have bugged me where I want to, it's like how most of the He-Man fans did want. give me some notes about That's Keldor's what I'm asking. background, including a family tree. Okay. Uh, that, that about how Keldor had a different mother from Randor, uh, that was a Gar, which was why Keldor yeah. was blue skin and Randor was not. Um, Miro had a white concubine <coughs> mistress, something, obviously before he married Randor's mother. And uh, that's yeah. So yes, yeah, they're they different mother. mothers. They're half brothers. They're, yeah, that I know. But yeah. I was just wondering about the older brother of Randor was a potential. Which is Keldor. Keldor is Randor's older brother. Okay, because I. I heard from this little excerpt thing, story thing, there was a yes. there was two brothers. One disappeared. Um, Mira had the concubine, which was a Gar priestess. To clear it up, two brothers. Two brothers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. This is it. Basically, comes from you know what looks great on a guy with a yellow skull, blue skin. That's where that <laughs> comes from. That's yeah. if you're. No, all all their colors were like that. Yeah, yeah. The reason that, well, actually, here's another one to throw out. Oh, the, the visual look for so many of the Master Universe characters from the U.S. People don't know that in 1979 and 80, Mattel was looking at a New Gods line based on the DC comic heroes. Perfect. And this proposed New Gods line. So I'm just extrapolating, but based on what I was able to locate in the Mattel archives, I'm, and based on how we work at Mattel in the design department, is I'm because of this new gods line they were doing, there were new gods Kirby art probably posted everywhere around the design area that they were staring at. But when you look at Manny faces, Ram Man, Man, and you look at a Man in Arms, there's definitely a lot in, in, in Zodak. I mean, so, there, Zodak is Metron yeah. from the new gods. I mean, he is Red. I mean, yeah, yeah. He is. So the, there's so much, you know, you Kirby new god stuff is because that's what the designers were staring at for the two years prior to Masters launch. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm guessing that based on. Uh, Which it, I mean, actually, if you the, the Masters of the Universe film, that live action film from 1987, is actually New Gods. The, they, the, it's basically uh, Apocalypse. Is, it, I mean, it's almost exactly the same. It's probably the closest we'll ever get. This yeah. we'll get to a New, new God Gods movie. movie. Yeah. It, it basically is mm -hmm. New Gods. Do you 
Beatles wrote a song about the Skeletor, you know that? But, it was about, but they discovered what his first name was, which was Helator. And they did the song. I know I'm maybe getting a little off topic, but just to keep giving Don all this credit. Many comics are talking about the great wars that were fought in the past, or that Castle Grayskull was built by unknown hands. We took a lot of the verbiage and tried to use those as a base for the classics continuity and for the new mini comics. So the great wars, you're going to see those wars in issue two. I said that I needed a way to start the story off. I needed an opening line that was sort of a grabber. And I, and I, I guess He Man was coming back home or something. I forgot. What. Coming back from someplace. So, you know, he wasn't going to the Ralph's market or somewhere. So I just <laughs> thought the Great War is, I totally forgot about it recently and asked me about that. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but apparently everybody, you know, picked up on it. You've got to be careful well, what you say. And that's so powerful, too, though, because, you know, obviously, obviously he man owes a little bit to J.R. Tolkien and it owes a little bit to Buck Rogers and it owes a little bit to, you know, sort of those two the sci fi and the fantasy genres put together. But uh, the human home after war, after battle, is a great setup by, you know, I mean, that's a Flash Gordon, all those sort of classic heroes, you know, so it all kind of comes from those archetype fantasy characters. I think the one, I think we have one, you We're, we're nowhere close to that. You, uh, yeah, I just don't know what yeah, I mean, believe me, we would love to do movies and cartoons and comic books. I know everyone in this room and at this convention I'm online are really passionate about masters, but one of the cons about the internet is that people, I, I use this term lately, they're louder than numerous. <laughs> masters vs. Classics is a tiny, 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 tiny done by a bunch of people like myself and Terry who do it in our spare time because we love He-Man. My regular job at Mattel is Green Lantern. Uh, you know, the movie didn't take off phenomenal, but it was a big toy line for us. Masters is something that Terry and I and the Horsemen, you know, we just do it because we love the property and Mattel's basically, it makes enough money to basically simply pay the bill to keep going. I know everyone wants to see it expanded into this and that and mini comics. Until there's something new, like a new TV series or a movie, you know, just to manage expectations. I mean, not to knock fans or, or knock anyone, but it, it's just not big enough. You know, the fun's just really at the end of the day, every time I see negative comments online, I always want to say the same thing: you're getting new He-Man characters every month. Like yeah. that alone is how big that is. Like you're at a He-Man con. Yeah, <laughs> like this is a huge deal. Yeah. Like this is a lot bigger than people give it credit for. This. Or you know, Shira's hand is drawn on F issue two or something. That wasn't the joke. One new He-Man figure on the fifteenth of a month is like such a big deal that people I think take it for granted a lot because we're so passionate. Time is slowing, but expanding the mini comic in every issue is really not the fault. I mean, I think we've just kind of talked about this before. The idea that it would, what could make the comics work is if someone would, like a publisher would license it. You know, like, like if uh, IEW or Dark pay that, you know, to, to license it, like they did Star Comics in the, or DC Comics in the 80s and, and Star Comics in the mid 80s. So, um, that shit free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already writing it for free. Yeah. <laughs> like all the all the like the script I gave you, I wasn't if you will pay for that. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I got paid more for this. You, yeah, definitely. You actually got paid to work on the yeah. comics. Yeah. I but, did it on Saturday morning. Right, exactly. Um, but I mean, you know, like it, the, I think the tough things with comic stuff, comics is already sort of a, a smaller it's a smaller world anyway. I mean it's not it's not unknown, but it's certainly smaller than movies and all that sort of stuff. So you just have to, I, I think fans, a publisher needs to know that there's fans out there to support an ongoing monthly comic, so just keep yelling, because that stuff doesn't hurt. I mean, I, I think the tough thing, Mattel can only do so much, obviously, with, the, with their sort of stuff, but a publisher will take a risk if they think they can make a buck. 
that there's a much better chance of a monthly yeah. actual comic happening than continuing the minis. Yeah, mini comic. Because the minis are such an investment for such a low run and from you have to print them just to put them in the figures. Right. There's a much bigger chance if the noise gets to actually get a licensing program right. going and do and you know, I mean, obviously, Dark Horse has worked for them, and, and you know, DC. Uh, Jeff Johns is a huge He-Man fan. He never runs the show with DC, um, but you just have. I mean, I think if, as, I, me as a fan too, you just have to keep yelling about how you'd like them to replace. Or that you guys get on the internet and say how much you'd like this. That I mean, everybody's you looking the power. Right. Everybody's looking for comics. In this way, since down work. Monthly comics, and since Larry wrote comics, for comics. It, it costs a lot to make comics, so it's a low industry. But if there's enough fans out there, somebody will do it. I mean, if there's enough people I think that could do it, I will license it myself. I'll do it myself and publish it through Image Comics. Like, it'll happen, but we just need to know you're there. So we just we want to do it. Yeah, no, I'll, do, I'll do it myself if I have to. But we need to know you're there. You know, that you'll buy it, that you'll support it. You'll go to the comic store every month. That's what we need to know. So when things like we sell less subs in 2012 than we did in 2011, that kind of sends the message that, okay, well, we've kind of mapped out the fan base. We know, you know how many people are out there that will buy anything, you know, at least one of every one. And we, you know, we can use that quota to determine everything from DVD sales to comic book sales. I mean, I know right. I'm extrapolating, but That's you, what it is. you do vote with your purchase. When you buy a master's toy from maddiecollector.com, free plug, you know, you're... Uh, <laughs> You're voting for not just more toys, but you're voting for more more of everything. So, you know, we're growing. It's, there's nothing but upward potential. You know, the door is open. Keep supporting the line. Keep supporting conventions like this. Keep coming dressed up as your favorite characters on Halloween. And uh, you know, from now to eternity. That's a perfect <laughs> place to stop right there. Uh, so, if you guys want to give these guys. A for signing media after this, is that right? I believe so. So go meet them, guys. Also, your your uh, host, your MC of the evening.